Hey everybody, Mike for Kest Vertu's always laughing. I don't know if he thinks we're behind or what. Like there's a long delay for the crowd. There's always a long delay. It makes people nervous. I'm not nervous. You're not? No, why would I be nervous? Well, I don't know. Have you ever done I've this? I've done before? this once or twice before. <laughs> Well, it's so good to see everybody. Welcome, Dr. John Turner, to the second shift live. Cheers. Thanks for <laughs> having me. Cheers, Cheers indeed. Uh, we'll get to learn a lot more about Dr. Turner here soon. But um, hey, welcome to the fourth, fifth? I don't know, dude. I'm I'm all fucked up. I, well, there's a lost we, one. Yeah, we, we did lost one. We lost one somewhere down the road. And there's the there's the F word. I just did it. Yeah, but it was. You broke the seal early. I know. I think I wanted to get out of the way before too many people were watching. <laughs> we never, we never, we rarely, I'm not going to say never, but we rarely have the problem of too many people watching. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we usually don't have, I mean, we, we do. It's not a problem. Occasionally we do. Like when we did the MRNA vaccine, holy crap, we had a lot. This one, not so much, but you know, this might be boring for people. I don't think it's boring. Oh, no, it's, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's not as topical as MRNA and yeah, yeah, we, we put the note out that we were doing it like on Friday. So, you know, well, it's, it's the week between Christmas and new year's people yeah, are it's like the lame duck like, week. It is. That's exactly right. People, the people don't know if they're coming or going or what's going on. Yep. No. Yeah. So anyway, our protocol review this is an episode we've been doing for four or five years. And, um, you know, we like we like doing it. And it's always a little, it's not sensitive, but I want to, I just want to lay out there why we do it, right? It's not, it, this isn't showing off our protocols, but one of the questions we get asked all the time is, you know, you know, how often do you update those? Or how do you go about updating them? Or what's in your protocols? Or, geez, do you allow paramedics to make suggestions about, updating protocols and just all these different things. So what we've started doing was, you know, based on those questions is just every year we just jump on and, and just give people a bit of a preview of some of the, you know, stuff that we're going to be doing uh, a little bit about the process. A lot of it's about the process. And that's why Dr. Turner's here. He was the chair of our protocol committee this year. Um, so he's got a lot more insight and, and um, background on a lot of this stuff. And, and really it's just a, Kind of just hang out. Jeff Beer says, Ratu, you need Dan Reed's hair. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Who's Dan <laughs> Reed? Do I know who Dan Reed is? Is it somebody we both know? I don't know. I don't know. He better explain it out in there. I hope he does. Well, it's good to see Jeff on here. He's a good guy. He's a member of the protocol committee, too. Or at least he was until he quit. He was. Not, not Clark not County. Blah, 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 blah. Counties. Yeah, he's so cool now. But he was on this year. Yeah, he was. So. And he's a heck of a good guy. So uh, happy post-Christmas to those who celebrate. What is today? So cheers to you guys for that. Uh-oh. What are you drinking? We got we to gotta do that. I skipped it. Or two. Hopworks Urban Brewery. Hub. Yep. A hazy IPA. Wishlist hazy IPA. Okay. Picked it up at the Costco today. If that isn't Portland, I don't know what is. I know. Right. Dr. Turner, well, did you end up going and grabbing anything or what? I I am drinking a Christmas gift. Oh. We did a, a gift exchange at work, and one of my work partners was uh, very generous and got me a 12-year uh, Yamazaki whiskey. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, so it's yeah, uh, I have not sampled tonight, and it is delicious. Hmm. I've not sampled the Japanese whiskeys. Me neither. I don't know it's what's going good. on. I endorse it. Well, the people that are watching, if you have the Japanese whiskeys, what do you? What's your take? Like, I'm more of a Tennessee. I'm more of a Tennessee, you know, you know, Kentucky bourbon guy. But you know, whatever. I want to know. No one's answering. It's, quite, it's a quiet group tonight. It is. Uh, you know, Jeff mentioned Dan Reed's hair, and then that was it. <laughs> uh, Nick Adams did say, drink one for the F word. So cheers to that. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, anyway, like I was saying, 
happy post Christmas to everybody that celebrates. If you don't, then that's cool. Happy uh, Monday to you guys. Uh, we had a nice quiet little time at home. Didn't do much. Just laid low. Like I hope most people did. And, and there were two, you worked right. And Turner, you work too. I work every Christmas being the, being the Hindu family. I, I, uh, we don't celebrate Christmas. So we, I have worked every Christmas. I mean, you know, since I got out of residency, so that would yeah. be uh, yeah, 24 years. A couple years. 24 years. Wow. Yeah. And I usually get, um, and then I get every Thanksgiving off typically, and sometimes 50 50 on, on New Year's. Oh, yeah. Are you working this New Year's? New Year's? I'm working New Year's Day because. I knew early on I wouldn't have a bull game to worry about. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's you know, all good. You know, Michigan didn't didn't do super great this year. No. Yeah. Well, we won't even talk about the Ducks. Somehow they slid into some weird shit and <laughs> Pac-12 champions. Pac-12 champions two in a row. Champions. Yeah, definitely asterisk. Um, definitely. Uh, a strange way to have it go down. I, it was weird, but I don't, I don't want to uh, bore people with it, but we slid in whole team got COVID. They couldn't formulate a team. So we slid in and we won some somehow. Yeah. It was, it was whatever. It was good. <laughs> Dr. Turner, you said you worked, right? I worked. I worked Christmas Eve, Christmas day after. We share holidays uh, in our group and try to split it so there's a little bit of equal time. Sounds like you had them all. I did. I got I got quite a few of them this year. <laughs> if, if this is the year to do it, you know, we'll just we'll just do it for 2020. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. I hate to break it to everybody. Everyone thinks that 2021 is going to be some miracle. I don't think so. <laughs> I was like, I can't wait for 2020 to be over. <clears throat> Why? Like, it's like nothing, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's, magical. it's, it's, magical. Magical. it's not something different. Yeah, it's not something different. How's your arm doing, by the way? You're what, 10 days out or two from your shot? I'm nine days. Ooh. I'm good. It was really only sore for the, like the, the one day afterwards and tiny bit um the next day but yeah you know um i am selling my iphone i've tried to buy an xbox um oh. putting windows yes. on every device i can <laughs> but other than that hey you're feeding into it buddy you know someone's watching going yeah i've yeah. got incredible yeah. 5g reception now incredible <laughs> incredible and and if you scan my arm when you're purchasing microsoft products i get a 20 percent discount Oh, you mean you get a kickback? I do. <laughs> now, Dr. Turner, you got yours too, right? I did. I got mine a week ago. And you're good? No third time. eye? Nothing weird going on? No, no. It was pretty uneventful. Uh, I did get the sore arm the next day. Well, actually later that day and then, you know, 24, 48 hours. But by about 48 hours later, I was feeling fine. Yeah. I couldn't tell if... Uh, couldn't tell if the night after I got it, I slept well because of the shot or because I was tired from ripping out carpet or something else, but eh, it's pretty, pretty uneventful. Well, that's good. That's the way it should be. I've seen a couple of people that have got it recently, just posting on the old Facebooks or whatever and said that their arm was definitely, definitely a little more sore, but again, how much, how much psychological is playing into that? I don't know. Like I would be worried every single little thing that would happen to me after I get mine. Like, oh, this is sad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, and I can totally today. God, is that here. because I? <clears throat> I can totally see you do that too. I'm just sitting here watching. <laughs> Nick can see your brain just do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. I would. Hmm, what's happening? <laughs> Well, I think we've all been doing that the last year, though. Like, you know, the the, the little, oh, I, I got a little sniffle or I got a yeah. little, you know, what's that? My ears ache or, you know. Totally. Yeah. Well, totally did it. So, we're two. Are you a fantasy football champion? Damn, look at this guy. 
<laughs> this was this past weekend was most fantasy football league Super Bowl. Okay, because most pe- most leagues don't run into the last week of the season because many teams bench players to rest them or whatever. So this was our Super Bowl. Been in the same league now for like twenty eighteen years, and yeah, I won. I won the Super Bowl. I win the money. I won, I won the, money. the money. That's so good. Yes, very excited. I have not played in like two years. It just became too much because I was playing multiple leagues. It would be Saturday night. All of a sudden, Sunday morning comes. I get an alert that somebody's out. Ah, it's just stupid. It was too much to do. <laughs> I've got a pretty solid routine where like Tuesdays Tuesdays you do your your spend about half hour on it and then the rest of the time it's just kind of happy, you know, you get updates if somebody's going to be out, but yeah. but no, I had a pretty I had the best team I've ever had by far. This is not the only time I've won that league, but but uh, I was pretty loaded. I was pretty pleased with my team. Yeah. John, you ever get into the fantasy football? I don't. Yeah. I'm over it. All right. Let me let me let me move a couple things around here. And while I'm doing that, let's see, how did I want to do that? I had it all planned out. Oh yes, right here. Hey, I did was you talking, tell us what you were drinking? Talk to myself. No, I didn't. I was drinking. It's gone now. Uh, Makers 101. Makers 101. Just a little, just a little bit of neat, a little bourbon. Whiskey, I mean, sorry. It was whiskey. Jeez Louise. I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm it's uh, not- Baker's 101 is not a bourbon? No, it's a it's a whiskey. Mm. It is a whiskey. There you go. I learned yeah. something new. Yeah, with a Y. Not like a I E Y, whatever. It's whiskey. W H I S K Y. Okay. A little whiskey. Yeah. Anyway, all right, let's get down to it. Boy, there's a lot of second shift logos on here, isn't there? It was not my intention. Let me see <laughs> I see at least two of them on there. Uh, Jiminy Advertising ourselves within the within the actual. within ourselves within ourselves right. within ourselves. Yeah. Well, you know what? I got to be honest with you. <laughs> I think our little podcast logo is probably one of the best. To be honest with you, I think it's awesome. I mean, it's got the little metroscape in the background with the buildings. It's Did you got... do that? Mike? No, heck no. I, <laughs> I'm not one of these guys. Um, Evan Clanch did that, and. uh it's pretty good. Like it's got our names on. I mean, it looks pretty good. I guess the one trade-off is is our intro music doesn't say our names. That's the one thing that's I guess maybe a little bit different, right? Well, so like it's Lighthouse. It, Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis of Mike Verkest. Well, I think that the original intro did have the names, but it was you and Eric. Right. It's never got updated. It never and we ne- never updated. We talked about updating getting a new intro. Yeah, but we still haven't it's done it. Talk about changing the theme music. Yeah, really, what I want to do is I want to get one of those voice actors that can do like Christopher Walken or somebody and go, you know, <laughs> I can't do a Christopher Walken, but you know, or a, or a, I don't know, somebody just an impersonator and make it awesome. Maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger or something, or I don't know. I can do it a little Howard Cosell, but nobody would get that reference. No, come on, bro. This ain't seventy eight. <laughs> you know, you're, you like that nostalgia. All right, let's jump in here. Uh, Nick Adams says it's almost as good as the standard of care. Uh, take, take it easy there, Chief. Calm but down it, there, Nick. Yeah, that, that ain't how it me. works there, Rook. All right, let's let's get you up to like eighty or hundred episodes. Then we can talk, or maybe ten. Yeah, could we? Do I hear four? Do yeah. I hear four? <laughs> All right. You know, we add, you know we add somebody to the family, and they you know Jarvis starts talking shit. Now Nick's talking shit. You know, <laughs> welcome to the fucking family. Oh, there's two. Show drinks. a little bit of respect. <laughs> oh, the family. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Now it's starting to get weaky, weaky. He said, oh, wow. All right, let's <laughs> jump in here. So, again, uh, before we get jumping in here too far, uh, Dr. Turner, would you do us a favor and introduce yourself to our second shift listenership? Who are you? What do you do? Where do you? What's the story with you? Oh, man. Where to start? Uh, well, my um, my name is John Turner. Um, I am a Libra. <laughs> um, I 
Uh, I grew up in Southern Oregon and uh, I went to college and got a degree in political science, which uh, definitely gets you on the track to medical school. Um, and I, I, after I finished school, I, I worked in, in politics uh, and uh, policy in the state of Oregon for about six, seven years and did campaigns and worked in the legislature and worked on some healthcare policy. Hmm. And I worked for a number of great people and uh, eventually um, worked for a, a legislator who was also a doctor and got inspired to uh, get down the, the medical track and uh, with a lot of great support and encouragement, went to medical school, uh, went to OHSU and uh, got into residency and did the first year of my residency in Las Vegas, Nevada, University Medical Center there and uh, finished my emergency medicine residency at OHSU and uh, I've been practicing now in the Portland area for uh, a couple of years and uh, last year I was uh, invited to be the uh, associate medical director for one of our counties here in the, the local region, Clackamas County, and was um, also uh, at the same time asked to be the chair of this protocol development committee, which we're going to talk about. So yeah, for it sure. was quite uh, quite an honor and a privilege to to have all that really so early in uh, in my career and um, yeah. No, well, that's awesome. Again, thanks for jumping on with us. And uh, a little bit of what we usually do is talk about the process. And part of the process wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about the committee. And now it seems like last year, sometime, something like that, we started trying to figure out how long has this metro regional sort of protocol committee been going? And I think the last I remember, and Ratu, you can jump in, or John, if you remember, but I was hearing early 80s. Does that, does that seem about right? I swear to God, that's what I heard somewhere. I don't know if it was from Dr. Schmidt, somebody, because it came up. I, I remember Terry mentioning something about the 80s. Yeah. Um, but but uh, certainly early 90s, Yeah. Um, it had been going on. Yeah. So. Yeah, so. Uh, anyway, it's so it's it's been a while. So the sort of the 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 work has been laid for a long time for us to have sort of a process in which we look at our treatment protocols every year. And so, essentially, what the protocol committee is is a representative from each agency that is in that metro regional area. So we've got fire, we've got ambulance. Uh, and then we also have a medical director. So all the medical directors from the regional area also chime in. And then the chair of the committee typically sort of bounces from one of three counties. It's either Multnomah County, Washington County, or Clackamas County. Well, as you might recall, if you've been listening to us for any amount of time, Dr. Sani is the medical director for both Washington and Clackamas County. Well, in 2019, Washington County was the chair and they handle all the administrative pieces, um, you know, the minutes, the meetings, this, the whole nine, the whole sort of administrative piece, I guess, to the committee. And it was coming, coming to be Clackamas's turn. And well, there, I think was the first realization that being the medical director for both counties, <laughs> sucks, right? <laughs> so anyway, so I think through some hard negotiations and some arm twisting, they convinced Dr. Turner to chair the committee this year. <laughs> Mostly it was just a lot of um, kissing, kissing up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a sure. lot of like, you're such a great guy, John. <laughs> and we now that I'm done, now. the veil has been lifted. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it is, it is a lot harder than it seems to be the chair of the committee because it's quite the group, right? And I think those, I don't know if Jeff's still watching or anyone else from the local area that's on there, but anyone who's ever been to the committee there, it, you know, we, it is full of professionals, right? And, and there are a lot of people that have a lot of passion for what we do and it can be a difficult group to harangue. And I think, I mean, obviously, and, and of all years to have COVID pop in. So not only would they have our normal our normal protocol committee, but then, of course, we had 
umpteen other meetings due to COVID protocol changes or actually developing a COVID protocol. Um, and then ultimately working on al al alternate destinations and all the other kind of stuff. So how did you, uh, how did you feel it went this year, John? <laughs> Well, you know, I think that, how did it go? <laughs> yeah, how did it go, brother? I well, you know, when I reflect on on a year ago, because I think that's kind of when we first started to talk about, uh, you know, well, would you would you be interested in doing this? Um, and my my questions were, well, so what is what does it all entail? Um, some of the some of the answers that I got back with, well, you know, it's, it's, it's organizing and it's, you know, developing a, a kind of a plan for the year and, um, you know, um, making sure that meetings stay on track and, and, you know, a lot of that's true, but I think as we've experienced in general with 2020, uh, best laid plans are, uh, you know, are, are beautiful, but, uh, but somebody else has, has got a plan, uh, and that was and that was COVID this year. Um, you know, we I think my initial thought was was uh, implementing a little bit more, you know, technology this year. Um, and, Thank God. You know, I <laughs> I originally you know did things like uh, putting together a you know like a um, it wasn't a Google group, it was a Google uh, a drive, so we could share some. Um, of the materials and all have access to kind of working drafts and presentations and sharing um, sharing some of like the literature uh, that was uh, the basis for some of the presentations and discussions. And that was really cool um, and something that I was really uh, kind of proud about moving forward. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, March, March happened uh, yeah. when when pretty much overnight we decided to uh well it really was it was the night before it was the night before yeah i remember there were like two different zoom accounts and people were signing on to different places yeah but we had um this is an in-person traditionally an in-person meeting um at one of our hospitals and you know there's what 30 something people typically in the room oh, yeah, for at sure. least it's a big group um and uh um it's it so yeah there there well, was and the complication this year too was that we like we we didn't reserve the normal room that we have early enough and so we were in negotiations with the hospital about getting back into the room that we were usually at and and COVID well, actually had the the problem. The hospital was like gone yeah so we didn't have anybody <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, overnight we uh, um, thankfully Mike's uh, his his agency had been using Zoom for a little bit of time, and Thank overnight, you. you know, we we made that transition to using Zoom and and doing virtual meetings. Um, that was that was a blessing. So, yeah, well, yeah. We all had we all just, we had to sort of switch gears pretty immediate, as like most people did probably. You know, in those early stages of COVID, we'd had one in-person meeting, which was all screwed up because they gave us the wrong rooms and all that kind of crap. And then we did Zoom. But anyway, so typically the way we have the the the, the work group sort of broken up is is we have different we have different work groups within the bigger group, right? So if there if there are something that is going to come up and it's a change in a cardiac protocol, then that would that would typically rest with that working group. And typically uh, there would be a standing n number of people within the cardiac group or the trauma group or the peds group or the OB group or whatever medical stroke, STEMI, whatever. Um, those people would sort of have. Middle. So at the beginning of the year, people submit their ideas for protocol changes. And um, and then at some point, those get sort of feathered out and broken up. There's a chance for people to sort of plead their case. We get people on the calendar and throughout the rest of the year, we sort of... Um, figure out what we're going to do. So that, you know, even with COVID happening this year, we were uh, really able to get a lot and a ton of work done. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, something as simple as we used to do all that stuff offline, email, texting people, 
whatever. But ni- it was nice to have that that Google group, that Google Drive, that had everyone's resources in it. It was very organized. We had a QR code. Boom, hit that. It could bring up the drive. It was it was really great. So um, major kudos to you. You did a wonderful job. It was are you a pleasure. millennial, John, technically, or are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody who, you know, it's funny because we all like to think we're tech savvy, but but John shows up and is like, well, why don't we just do a Google Drive? We're all like, oh shit, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and some of the questions that we get, and Dr. Sani, I'll throw this one to you. Why why do we look to update our protocols every year? I know that there's a lot of places, and this is a question I've got for the uh four people that are watching right now. If you could throw in the comments there, how often do you update your protocols. I know we do ours annually. Sometimes we have an early adopter if something changes majorly, but why annually, Dr. Sani? Well, I, you know, I always think of it as like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, you start on one end, you finish it, and you start again. Um, medicine is changing always. and But instead of, um, I, I think the piece about doing it annually is nice. It's just that we just know going into February, we're going to have protocols to start working on. And so it just creates a nice rhythm for like, let's, what, what has changed in the last year? You know, otherwise you're, you're kind of stuck in this. When should I change? When should I change? When should I change philosophy? And, and for us, you know, we look at data, we look at, we can talk a little bit more about the process itself, but we just know that we're going to, look at stuff at least once per year. And that doesn't mean we do like a comprehensive review. There's been a couple of years where we did embark on some stuff like that. But I mean, usually we open up and like, like we should be getting that soon. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we should be, you know, what do you guys want to change? What's interest? You know, we look for, for it's very driven by, in by what do people want to do? It's not necessarily like a plan heading into like January or February, but we have between, you know, if you look at, I always like to point out that like, if you look at like most of our medical direction leadership, I'm like, I used to be one of the younger ones and I'm not that young. Um, But, you know, when you've got your John Jews and Mo Diaz and people who've been around even longer than me, there's always, you know, there's just always good knowledge about what's kind of going on in the world of resuscitation or EMS in general. Um, so it's good. I mean, we just have this, this rhythm of knowing that this is what we're going to do. Um, and, and then it's good because I think, I, I think that's one of your slides, but our providers have a voice too, and they know that they can come to the table with stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a a good segue. You know, one thing that Nick just brought up, he says that they're constantly doing theirs, but they don't do everything at once. We try to do one or two updates per month that makes education easier for them. That's cool. I feel like we would never, I guess we're never really done either, right? I just feel like if you were to do it that way, and that's fine, like totally, but I feel like it would just never... It would just be this perpetual thing. Maybe it always is. I don't know. Well, it's just nice to have like a drop dead date. It's nice to be able to say that, you know what, whatever we're going to do and and what used to be, what used to drive it was this was the freaking print date, right? We have to have this locked in to be able to get it printed in time for people to have it in time to review it before January 4th or 6th or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so now, I mean, we'd still print some, but we, we push out the protocols electronically. Yeah. yeah. Now we use the, the PPP app for now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, a little bit different, but we still have to kind of lock them in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Our good friend, Bill Toon's on here. Thanks for uh, jumping on here again, Mr. Toon. Uh, and here's a philosophical question. Are protocols bad? Do they stifle critical thinking? Who else in healthcare uses protocols to the degree that EMS uses them? Interesting. Well, I and I think something that Dr. Sani's always said that is if he had his way, his protocols would be one page long and it would stay and it would say what? Don't do stupid shit. Don't do stupid shit. Exactly. 
Exactly. So um, I don't think we're quite there. In fact, there was a very lively conversation about protocols um, when we were in Ann Arbor, as I recall. Oh, I vaguely remember when we were in Ann Arbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was good. It was good. So anyway, um, so yeah, so we have a lot of medical directors. All of our medical directors are plugged in to the research pipeline. They all know each other. They're all part of NAEMSP. They're all they're all part of everything. So they know kind of what's going on there. So we usually have an idea, a perfect example, um, which we didn't have specifically in here, but we'll just bring up is we'll just talk about IV access for cardiac arrest, right? Like we had a mid, a midterm is what I kind of call it, protocol change where, you know, based on some data, some literature that was come out, two studies actually that were sort of looking at, um, was it, what was it? The Alps, Alps yep. and the, another one. That was Alps. It was, it was a review of the Alps trial with, by, by location of the line. Right. And anyway, found Mo, that Mo uh, was the lead author on that. Dr. Daya. Yeah. Yeah. Did we ever have Dr. Daya on here? No, we didn't. I thought we were nope. going to. Anyway, so we, we, we discovered kind of based on some of this research that, you know what, maybe IO isn't the best, a tibial IO isn't the best for cardiac arrest resuscitation. And so the, the data seemed pretty compelling. So what we did, we made a change right off the bat. Um, and that was sort of July-ish, if I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And decided, hey, you know what, we're going to go and we're going to change the protocol right now. We'll have IV is uh, first first choice, like a good AC or an EJ or something like that. Peripheral IV in cardiac arrest. If you can't get that, then you can do a humeral IO. If you can't do a humeral IO, then you can do a tibial IO. And if that don't work, or if that works, then get an IV after you get that that tibial IO because it's, it was pretty compelling. So we, we do make changes as we need to, but generally speaking, they will come out in January, first Monday, usually of January. And Kind of that's what we're going to talk about today, some of those updates. But anyway, so um, you sort of teased it a little bit, but I'm a paramedic and I want a new protocol. How does that work? Well, like Dr. Turner mentioned, there is absolutely opportunity for anybody to suggest a new protocol, a new medication, a new procedure, a new widget of whatever kind it is. And you have the floor, right? And that is one of the cool things that I really like about our system. And believe me, we've had some really, I can think of Garth, Hope Melnick coming through with some strong OB changes about four years ago. It was really amazing. Uh, Jeff Beers had a number of them. Sean Shanahan's had a number of changes. I've suggested a couple. One of them made it through this year. I got sort of skunked. I got skunked. I got lift assist. That, that was, was it. I don't know what happened to our uh, ramp triage. What happened to ramp triage? <laughs> Golly. Anyway. They got covid in, actually, I think. Yeah, I think it did get coveted, but we're coming back strong COVID-ed. with ramp. We're coming yeah. back strong with ramp. Yeah, right. and Raven got a couple in. You know, the Raven, OB yes, our old friend this from year, Dillard. last year. Yep. Well, and Taylor uh, with the uh, transgender. Uh, yes. Protocol. Yes. Yes. Yep. Thank you. We got some big ones. Yep. Exactly. So protocols are open. It is an open kind of thing for everybody. So essentially, what we will do. Um, uh, I'm trying to just look through the the, the old ch- chat here going. Is anyone still using the Fast One? We've never used it in our area here, uh, Jared. So I'm not too sure about that one. But, um, you know, we've always had great luck with the EZIO. So we've been using it since the inception and no real compelling reason to change. So um, how quickly are protocols generally updated in response to new data? Well, I think if it's compelling enough to make a change, we can make it within a month, probably. Um, you know, the COVID stuff, we came up, we met three or four or five, six times, came up with some stuff and and had a new COVID. And we, you know, put in some of those measures to keep our provider safe and, you know, reduce the, you know, aerosol generating procedures. You know, we were able to replace, <clears throat> you know, a lot of our nebulizers with either meter dose inhalers or breath actuated nebulizers, something that's not going to be spraying stuff everywhere. Uh, we looked at CPAP. We looked at all the different things. And so I, I thought we did a really amazing job uh, in a pretty short yeah. amount of time to get that going. But I also think, I think in, with regards to, to Samantha's question and 
it, it is always good to have the better half of the standard of care join us in the, True. In the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, I think that, you know, if Mike Sayer from C- who's in Seattle now, <clears throat> who, who's one of my mentors in EMS and somebody that I met when I was a, a, a medical student, actually, um, you know, he did some work that showed that the time from like a new guideline that being developed and published to implementation in the EMS world is like eight years or seven years. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if that was sort of the point to Sam's question. I would say that if you look at our kind of standard way, kind of the, why do we do this annually? Mm-hmm. I would say that we, because we have a lot of people who are out there and like know what's going on in the world. We turn stuff around and get stuff into our protocols based on the data, I think much faster than, than many places. Now I do want to say this, that one of the reasons we do this, um, we don't, we actually are, we like our protocols and are proud of them, but we also realize that they're not the shit. Yeah, no, not at all. Definitely. There's some stuff when we do this review that we know some of our audience is like, they're doing that now. We did that like six years ago. Yeah. And to Jacob Rackley's point on here, he said that girth had strong arguments for diltiazem. Well, we've never had diltiazem in our protocols till this year. Right. Anyway, and, so that's a perfect and, example. And so we, you know, kind of, we get that, but I will say that like whenever, whenever AHA comes out with new guidelines, it's never a stressor for our system because we've usually, already implemented the ones that we're going to implement all before they came out as a guideline yeah. because of our participation in rock or, or, you know, having folks like Dr. Daya, Dr. Dugard, who we've had as a guest on the show, yep. um, who've been writing the, the articles that lead to some of these guidelines changes for some of them, we're usually ahead. Um, and then for other stuff, we're behind. We're going to talk about TXA today briefly. Uh, and I know a lot of people implemented TXA three or four um, yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're, we we are some places, I think, where we're way ahead and other places where we're, like, just catching up. Um, or there are system reasons why we don't want to – we can't do them the way other folks do. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's a great point. We'll talk – I mean, I think there's something to be – when we get to deltaism, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, we, we did a ton of research in our own system looking at the need for deltaism, right? And yeah. it just – it wasn't there at the time. So, anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll get around to that. So we are 40 um, minutes into it. We should probably, like, jump into the actual well, – I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Look at Turner. He's giggling. Yeah, I'm not a broad ginger. But I'm mm. So anyway, so one of the things that we always do in our protocols is we always have a little uh, a little summary of changes for people because um, I, I don't know if if you guys that are watching if you guys do any kind of you know uh, what's the word I, I, word smithing I guess could be the thing you know a, a lot of times what ends up happening for changes, there's sort of minor sort of, you know, ver- verbiage changes. And so what we do is tend to track every single change that has ever been made in our protocols and whatever's been new for the up year coming, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we always throw in a summary change. This is just a snapshot of, of what they look like. There's about four pages of these. Um, and we have the title, the page, the section, and then the description of the change. Now, sometimes, again, it's just updated language. Sometimes it's a whole new protocol, maybe a whole new, uh, you know, medication or something like that coming in. But here's here's an example of one that uh, this is Dr. Sani's favorite one, and we'll expect some good literature uh, based on XStat from him. I'm just kidding. Uh, I won't get into the discussion pre-show about this one. But XStat, this is a perfect example of kind of one, how our protocols sort of look, right? And then how we tend to implement them. Now, there was a pretty hefty discussion going around on Facebook the other day. That's probably been a couple of weeks ago. And it was about like how long or how big are your protocols? Somebody just posed the question. I think it was Ann Farina. She's like, you know, how big are your protocols? And people are like, you know, 24 pages, 62 pages. And I'm like, ours is like 300 pages. Like there is a ton of protocols in here. 
Um, but this is kind of gets back to the old ultimate question is, is what purpose did the protocol serve? Are you supposed to train people in this? Do you give them just a guideline of when to use something? Do you like, what exactly is the purpose of a protocol and what should it kind of look like? Right? So anyway, so this is an example of X stat. So we've actually had X stat in the system for about a year. Uh, we were supposed to be doing a study. I don't know if we all got to ended up participating in that study. Um, but XStat is a first in kind expanding dressing approved for internal use. So if you guys recall, um, there are um, uh, sometimes there are places where we can't put a tourniquet specifically in those junctional areas, right? So this is an opportunity uh, to maybe take care of some of those junctional areas um, and be able to handle that. So that's kind of XStat. There's a couple of different versions One's a smaller one, one's a bigger one. It's a big syringe full of little, uh, I don't know, dressings, I guess you could call them little gauzes and they expand and foam up and they they don't foam up, but they stop the bleed. Cool. Anything else to add, Dr. Sani? I know, you, you know you're a big fan of this one. <clears throat> I'll take that as a no. No. Turner, anything to add on on X stat? It was kind of a funny one. I just wanted to throw that in there. I mean, it is what it is, right? Okay, so he's not even going to say anything. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the next one. Um, and this one, this one is just a real quick one. But you know, this was sort of talking about evidence based practice. And I saw, I think it was Bill or somebody had a comment in there about our protocols. Are they evidence based? Are they consensus based? And the answer is probably yes. Um, bo I, both. I've always described our protocols as evidence guided. Yeah. So, you know, there are evidence based guidelines in in e EMS out there. I've participated in the development of a couple of them. Yeah. Um, and then NAMSP has actually funded an an, uh, an evidence evidence based guidelines center for EMS that is actually supposed to develop guidelines. But when I think of describing something as evidence-based, it's a very rigorous process that we don't in any way, I'll be honest, even though, um, even though it's pretty good, we don't do grade methodology level work when we do these, these protocols. Um, so I don't, to me, that's when you say something's evidence-based, yeah. you use a, a you use a sort of approved, accepted method called something like grade, which is uh, um, you know for us to create a guideline. As an example, when we did that, there's an evidence-based set of guidelines for pre-hospital pain management, and there were. 20 of us on that committee and we all put in like 15 to 40 hours of prep work before that committee even met. So you're talking about, you know, 800 hours of prep work. Um, we don't, we do a lot of work. We don't do that much work and we don't use a, a like a accepted methodology like grade. That being said, we look at the literature. Uh, um, and so I always considered, I call them sort of evidence guided. Yeah. What are, you, you, what are your thoughts, John? I think that it's obviously the process is better than just um, expert opinion. Um, I think that, that evidence guided is, a, is definitely a good uh, description. But I think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned about our process that um, may be unique, maybe hopefully isn't unique, but that obviously with a bunch of, you know, EMS providers and a bunch of medical directors in a room, you're going to get a lot of different opinions. And what our, our, <laughs> our protocols are is consensus driven. And so if there's, um, you know, if, if there's not uh, broad consensus about something, then we don't, we don't move forward with it. So I, I think that's a very good description. Dr. Yeah, and, I, and I think it, and I think that's really great. Um, but, you know, I think, and there's also a downside to consensus base as well, right? <clears throat> I mean, there there are things that you know maybe not everyone necessarily agrees with. That's nothing they're going to lose sleep about, but you know they it, it ends up in there, right? Yeah. 
um, or we can't make maybe make the change exactly the way we'd like to see it. But nonetheless, it's kind of in there, and that's sort of a you know you sort of settle for that. Um, and I think that's okay. And I think this this particular piece uh, on the slide that I've got up on the screen now this was a, this is just a verbiage change that was made <clears throat> in our endotracheal intubation protocol, right? And it's the highlighted piece there, and it says use of the bougie is encouraged for endotracheal intubation to facilitate first pass success. Now you might just think to yourself, well, who cares, right? Like why, why, is, why is that sort of a big deal? Well, I will tell you that it's, it's not often that you would see that sort of called out like that, right? And it just happens that, you know, the University of Washington about last week, and it was shared by the Annals of Emergency Medicine, as you can see on the little small part there on Twitter, um, you know, there was a randomized control trial that showed that bougie use absolutely improves your first pass success. So this is where I, I show the sort of correlation where <clears throat> is it is it evidence based? Yeah, I mean, this statement, I guess you could call it evidence based. Now, we made this change before this was released. But nonetheless, I think what our own data shows us, and I guess that goes back to another piece of this committee is we really need to look and measure and improve our own stuff and figure out what's going on. I know, Dr. Turner, you've taken a, a huge dive into the uh, airway data at my, at my agency, at our agency, I should say. Dr. Turner is also associate medical director for, for my agency, working with Dr. Sani. But, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've made pretty huge strides in our airway management. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really want to encourage people that are watching is like, or listening, depending on where you're at in this thing, uh, you know, a bougie is not for when you get in a jam, right? Like that is, that thinking is is sort of out there and rampant. Even people that I've talked to that I work with think that the bougie is like this rescue device of some kind. And I really want people's thoughts to sort of turn on that. That's that's not it at all. We, we need, you know, we know multiple attempts at intubation is bad. Um, and we know that bougie increases first pass success. So why don't we just use that from the get go? Right. But in their mind, it's it's old school and I'll only use it if I have to use it. And I just think that's flawed thinking. I'm just good enough to do it, you know, the old school way. <laughs> just, yeah, you know. So cool. Never mind that your first pass success rate was like, you know, 61 <clears throat> percent. Yeah. But I always got the tube. Right. Always Fourth got the time. tube. But I got it. Oxygen, hypoxia, be damned. That's right. I don't get it. Jared says, too many people considered the bougier video as a crutch. Yep. You got that right, brother. Yeah. The only the only interesting thing about the bougie is that that work is all done on um, standard blades. Yeah. Yeah. Not on high angulated blades. Yeah. So the regular, most regular bougies won't work with a high, with an angulated, blade, highly angulated blade. Yeah. In, in Washington County, we have this bougie that's more rigid that we that can work with a more angulated blade, but it is a different skill. Yeah. Practice with that bougie. All right. Bougie. All right. Bougie. All right. Next thing we're going to move on to TXA. So TXA is new for us this year. Um, and I think it's okay. We were a little, we were a little behind on this, but I think it was, um, I think there were multiple reasons why we were quote behind on this. Would you agree with that, Dr. Sani or Dr. Turner? I mean, it wasn't like we just ignored it. We talked about it every year for the last five years, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And so what changed this year? Why Why this year? Dr. Turner, do you want to take that one? <laughs> well, I think there was a couple of studies that, that came out, right? You guys have talked about uh, in, in your various podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I... Um, I think I'm going to defer to you guys. You guys have you've covered this in length. I think that, that you should you should jump in this one. Yeah, I think we should let you struggle with this one a little bit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. No. So I I think you know I will I will say this in Oregon. So I for most most of you guys probably know or remember or don't care. Uh, so I sit on I sit on the. Um, the Oregon Medical Board EMS Committee. And one of the, <laughs> so our scope of practice is pretty straightforward. It says that, you know, we can give any medication that our medical directors or any physician says that we can give. And uh, there then, and for, I will just tell you that at least a couple of years ago, 
TXA was being shunned upon by what we would call the big board. And that is the Oregon medical board, right? The board of physicians, they, many um, felt that it was uh, dangerous. And one person. Have, it was one person. But it was the important person. It was the chair. It was the chair, right? Who was also a trauma surgeon in our system. Yeah. Um, felt that it was, it was not, uh, we should not be giving this at all. So um, it was interesting. So that's not the reason why we held off, but you know, we, one of the, the, the pieces that is unique about our, our protocol is that we, again, we have members from our two level one trauma centers that are on our committee, right? We, we consult the surgeons, we consult the level one traumas. And so it was just a, it was, it was a long time coming. Um, but we finally threw it in there and not only did we throw it in there for the usual things, and this is where I want Dr. Sandy to take this. Um, so of course, hypotension, right? Bleeding out, we're going to give it in trauma, but we're also going to give it for traumatic brain injuries. And I just want to give a quick plug. If you're thinking about that, or you're sounds familiar that Dr. Jeff Jarvis, and I think I might've been in this one too. I don't remember. Uh, but if you go on YouTube, you were superficially there, but yeah, I was getting word in with Pickett and Jarvis. Yeah, I, think I, did, I think I did the bookends. I think <laughs> I opened and did some stuff. Then they did the actual review of the literature and then we closed it out on a live. But anyway, if you go on YouTube um, and uh, the flight bridge YouTube and just look for the TXA and TBI, um, there's a great study that talks about it, but we decided to go ahead with TBI. So we had, and then we added, we actually added um, hemorrhagic shock kind of as a, as a bonus, or yeah. as we used to say in New Orleans, as they say in New Orleans, lanyap. But, um, but uh, um, we were, um, we are, we participated in the TXA study that was published in JAMA. Um, and the one, and, and if you read the study, it notably says that there was no difference in outcomes between the two groups. And you're like, well, then why did you add TXA for TBI? Um, but um, so our region, it was primarily Multnomah County, which is not the county that I'm involved, one of the counties I'm involved with, mm -hmm. that did this was participating in this study. And the lead author is one of the, the lead author uh, is one of the trauma surgeons at OHSU, Susan Rowell. And the senior author is Marty Schreiber, who, um, despite the fact that he has a terrible taste in college football teams, um, is also um, one of the trauma surgeons and is the, the senior author. And, and um, you know, they, they left that feeling pretty strongly that, that sort of moderately injured group um, that there was a benefit. And what's interesting is when you read the paper, both groups overall, no difference. Is it, is it data dredging? Is it, is it, is it uh, to some degree, maybe it is, but we, we felt um we had felt all along in some respect, there had been some energy to add TXA for TBI in our system and having our trauma surgeons come on board. And this is, you know, it's a collaboration. Absolutely. Having our trauma surgeons come on board and say, and we have two level ones in our, in our tri-county region, um, having the trauma surgeons at both level ones say, you know, they, they actually think that the newer data makes sense and, and felt that, uh, we should go ahead and add it. So we've added it this year, um, GCS of three to 12, but we also know that the people who are GCS three, who are um, fixed and dilated, who are never going to survive, won't survive whether or not we give TXA. So it's GCS three to 12 with, with reactive, a reactive pupil, pupil. Um, so those folks can get, and then based on the Guyette study that looked at TXA, TXA um, in a, for, uh, traumatic, for traumatic shock, we've added it also for severe traumatic shock. So that's another study that there was no difference between the TXA and the non-TXA group, but they use a systolic less than 90. But if you use a systolic less than 70, 
there was a difference. And so we, we added it for a systolic less than 70. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. So we got that coming out. So that's pretty exciting. Um, getting ready to roll that out here. Let's move on to the next one here. And this is one that'll probably be a head scratcher for people. Um, you know, again, we don't claim that we're the best thing in the world. Never have. Um, but we're finally getting diltiazem out there for people. <laughs> and, and, and quite honestly, but it's uh, limited. People, yeah. Not even that many people are going to even carry it. Um, I think for a couple of reasons, now let's, let's go back in time a little bit. So I remember it's probably been five years ago. We looked at Diltizem and what we did was actually pulled data from all of our, from all of our areas. And what we basically want to know were, you know, uh, we're, a philosophical question. Oh, I hear somebody. That was weird. Did uh, you that was me. Sorry. Oh, I would say that was, that's really far behind. Like that's really far behind. Um, anyway, we looked at data. We wanted to know. Because people kept wanting diltiazem, diltiazem. How come we don't have dilt? Blah, 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 blah. Give me dilt. I got it. It seemed like it was never ending. Never ending. So we wanted to see, um, since you cannot throw a rock without hitting a hospital in our area, we've got like 17 hospitals in this area here. We wanted to know, like, how many people went code three to the hospital? How many people had a systolic blood pressure of less than whatever? How many people ended up getting, you know, cardioverted? All this. We wanted to look at our own data to find out, is it worth throwing another drug into the box, because I'll tell you, for me personally, I mean, we've, we've got a new one with, you, you know, TXA coming up here. Um, you know, is there, is the juice worth the squeeze? I always like saying that, right? That's a good one. And so when we looked at the data, it wasn't, we didn't have that. I think there were three cases where somebody might've benefited and looking at all these calls from having diltiazem, but for whatever reason, and I don't remember the background on this one, maybe Dr. Turner, you can help me out, but um, somebody did suggest it. I think maybe it was Dr. Daya, was it? Was it the 12? Yeah, well, yeah, um, there's, uh, there's an agency in, in our county that that has been using it, right? And, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and we wanted to make sure that there was consistency um, and that if another agency wanted to use it, that it existed in our protocol book and that there was consistency across agencies across yeah. the county yeah. um, if they were going to, to carry it and use it and what the indications uh, for using it were be, would yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we threw it in, but I'll tell you, my agency's not going to carry it. Our transporting uh, ambulance uh, partners, as far as I know, aren't going to be carrying it. I mean, it's just there's no... Well, but there was a different take on it too, right? And, and one of the things that, that that spurred this discussion is that adenosine shows up on the shortage list. Exactly. So a, not only is diltizum something that you can use in rapid AFib, uh, which again, is there really an emergency? Is there an EMS indication for it? Right. I, I, the data is not there. Um, but, uh, you know, people who are in kind of SVT and they're uncomfortable, some people might argue that adenosine isn't necessarily needed either, that you just let them ride until yeah. you get to the hospital. But those people, they're going to be, they're going to be treated. So why not just treat them? And so when, when we were worried, when you're worried that adenosine isn't going to be available, Diltizum. And then some people argue because the data on diltizum versus adenosine mm. is that it's pretty similar in outcome, but you don't feel like you're going to die when you get diltizum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I literally, when I give adenosine, I tell people, um, okay, we're going to give you this medicine and you're going to feel like you're dying. And yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and there are, a, I've had it maybe once where a person said, don't, don't, don't give me, don't, don't do give that. me adenosine. Yeah. Don't, I will not do that again. Hmm. I have PTSD from when you gave me adenosine. I bet. So. Hmm. I mean, we're stopping people's hearts for a couple of seconds, right? I mean, it, it looks terrifying. <laughs> Doesn't hurt me any, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> there have been a couple of adenosine times where I'm like, okay, <laughs> anytime time now would be <laughs> great. Anytime. <laughs> Where's anyway. that? 
Yeah. So deal ties them, not super exciting, but again, uh, a little bit of the process behind that, why we do what we do. Now this next one I'm excited about. I'm going to catch a lot of shit in hell for it, but <clears throat> I am super excited about it. So you may or may not know. I know. And I think if, uh, yeah, Earl, Earl, Earl's, Earl's on here. And he said for outer parts of the County where there's not 11 hospitals. Yeah, exactly. Potentially. Uh, good to see you, Earl, by the way. Um, all right, lift assist. So you may or may not be aware, and I know Nick Adams pre helped me preach on this one, brother. Uh, so we go on a lot of, you know, lift assists or medical public assists. Uh, generally speaking, these are single resource. Somebody can't get up. Somebody slipped out of bed, whatever. No ambulance comes. It's, it's literally pick them up, put them back in bed you know, take care and we'll see you later. And those, um, for the most part, they are what they are, right? That's, that's what happens. Have a great night. We love you. Thanks for being a supporter. And, uh, I hope you feel better. Don't you go falling out of bed again. Right. <laughs> and so, um, but what most, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you're dancing. You're well, dancing. No, I, no, no. I guess I'm trying. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be super inclusive, saying this happens to everybody. But I will just speak to my own experience or to every agency. But these it happens to everybody. Okay, it these happen to everybody. It happens to everybody where these go bad, right? You put them back in bed, and the next two hours later they call. And now you're on a code, or the next day they've got a bleed, or there's something that has gone unrecognized more than most likely in that first encounter with the patient. I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, and so uh, our friends in San Antonio fire did a little study called the red flag lift assist. And I'll give you the short version of it. Basically what they did was they looked at their data and they found that um, most of these lift assists were probably never transported in that first encounter. Um, a number of them had a subsequent encounter in which they were transported. And then a number of those people had some pretty severe medical problems uh, that were discovered once they got to the hospital. So what they did was they came up with it with basically a checklist and I will show you what that looks like right here. And this is essentially it. So what they did was they had a run in period and this was a poster presentation at NAEMSP this year, just so you guys know. So we didn't make it up. Um, and we so, argued it. We ripped off and duplicated it. Yeah, we ripped off and duplicated. Yes. Um, God, was it Dr. Vitalani that I was talking to about this? Yeah. So you said San Antonio, but I think it was no, here. So that would it, be was, it was San Antonio fire, but I think he's part of that group with MedStar and everybody. So I, I know he was involved, but anyway, what they had was this, you go on a lift assist. You're going to get out this basically what they would call the red flag checklist. And you would go down and assess your patient for these things, abnormal mental status, any loss of consciousness, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, respiratory rate, an end tidal, an SpO2, a blood glucose, signs of new trauma, and use of sort of uh, oral anticoagulants. So if you had, if your patient did not meet any, meet any of these, Basically, what they would do is they would just do an abbreviated medical chart. They wouldn't do like what we'd call a 311, um, which is sort of a fire report only and no EMS chart because uh, there's no demographics. There's no information in those other infers reports, basically. Um, so if they did not meet any of these, they would just do an abbreviated medical chart. Okay, so demographics, what was the vital signs, any of these things that they measured on here, and then a short narrative, and then they were done. If they did meet one of these, then that popped them into the into a category to which if they uh, were able, if they didn't want to be transported they could, and they could still refuse, then we would just go down the normal refusal route, right? So an informed consent refusal. So that would be whatever your refusal is plus your medical chart, okay? So you were covered. And then if they were subsequently transported, then perfect. So that was kind of what their study was. And essentially what it looked at over was about 11 months was they found that, that there was about 50% more of these lift assist patients were then considered a patient because they met some of this criteria, right? doesn't mean they got transported, 
but they were actually had documentation performed. Thank God. Right. Cause I don't know how many times I've had to go look for a chart and guess what? No chart. Right. There was no chart. So it's just a lift assist. Just a lift a public assist. We put them back in. Public there. Assist. Yeah. 321. All right. Um, and so, uh, and so what they, they found a whole list um, the, the outcomes that patients had that they transported, that they were able to get outcomes on. They found people that had cancer that wasn't diagnosed yet. They found people that had uh, subdural bleeds. They found people that had um, a new onset of diabetes. They had people that were found um, in well along the road in sepsis. I mean, they found tons and tons of real issues with these patients. So it goes back to this even further. There's a lot of research being done now on patients looking backwards. So let's say we got a 70 year old male that ended up in a nursing home. Okay. So they go backwards in time. And what they found was that a lot of these patients have a sentinel event of some kind that got this process going for them. And it's one of these. It's a lift assist. It's a public assist. I couldn't get up off the floor for whatever reason that that moment where they slipped out of their chair or they couldn't stand up and get up out of their chair. Some, there's something to be said about that moment in time, then looking forward to all these things that occurred for these patients. And so um, it, it became super important to me because I've been sort of on the administrative side. I'm trying to adjust my seat here. Um, you know, trying to go through and, and deal with some of these calls as they come in. And, and it's really for us, I mean, I don't think it's work. It's not worth the risk to my agency and it's not good patient care if we're just throwing people back in their bed. Right. And so I proposed this uh, to be included in our protocols this year. And while there was a lot of consternation, um, I, I think is that, <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a fire department who claimed they had never ever in history messed up a lift assist. Right. Ever. Right. Exactly. Um Joe's, Joe Z wants to know does your protocol pack have a wellness check? Uh no, it does not, but it does have a definition of wh who a patient is. So it does have that for sure. Um, um but anyway. Uh, so we will see. So this, this sucker is getting ready to go out. I did a little addendum. So every year, along with the protocol changes, we do a video series where I worked uh, with Dr. Turner on one this year. Did you ever, did you do a video or two? Yep. I did the TXA with, oh, that's um, right. That's right. I did TXA with doc, with Sean, Dr. Wood. I did. I've given Sean a promotion. Um, <laughs> I've, I did TXA with Sean and I did the OB neonatal, with uh, Ann Raven, with Captain Raven. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, so anyway, so uh, Dr. Turner and I did a quick presentation. It was about 10, 10, 10 or 12 minutes long uh, on this, but I also did sort of an extra one uh, because what I did was I took this protocol or I should say the, the, let me, let me, let me, let me fix my thing here. So if you see at the bottom, you guys that are watching all the way at the bottom under notes where it says F, it says EMS fire agencies should and are encouraged to develop their own more expansive and detailed documentation policy specific to their own operations. One of the things that I did was I, I, I sort of took the checklist, which I'll bring back up again here. And then essentially what I did is at the bottom where it says those who decline transport shall be evaluated, blah, blah, all this kind of stuff here. And essentially what I did was I put in our agency's sort of expectations. So if they meet no criteria, then this is the documentation expectation. If they meet criteria, but they refuse, then this is the, it turns into a refusal on a chart, blah, blah, blah. And then if they get transported by uh, ambulance, then that's just a normal EMS yeah. that we would always do. So I really, I, I really tried to sort of square it away a little bit. So there's no confusion about kind of, and, and one of the key changes that you've made and one that is that, I, that we're, already feeling pushback on, but I think we just got to get through it is that even though, even if they meet, if they, if, if they have no boxes checked, yep. 
which means that it is appropriate to lift them. It could be appropriate. Doesn't guarantee it. Could be appropriate to lift them up and put them back into bed. And um, you are. We are still requiring a chart. Yes. On the EMS side. Yes. Which includes vitals. Yep. It's it's not a like eighteen page chart. No. Yeah. yeah. That's that abbreviated chart. That's basically yeah. demographics. It's uh, you know, detail uh, about what you assessed, right? The fact that they didn't meet, they didn't meet any of yeah. these and they were back. Because even very recently, we had a, one of these where we had to go back the next day. And when you went to go look for it, there was no chart. Yeah. And then in, in the, in the fire side, it just says no patient found this was a public assist. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and these are, I mean, you know, Nick and, Samantha are all over this, but this is a huge risk. Yeah, well, I, I think it comes down to. Sorry for jumping in, but no, I no, no go ahead, please. To, um, this is the right thing to do for the people that we serve and our patients, right? Is to assess and make sure that there's nothing going wrong. And if there's nothing going wrong and their vital signs look great, then we'll lift you up and we'll put you back wherever you need to be, right? You know, no harm, no foul. We'll go about the usual business that we've been doing. But it it just takes opening the box a little bit and looking inside and making sure that, yep, everything's good. Okay. You know, the the, the Mike, you didn't mention it yet, but the 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 one of the key takeaways from the data out of Texas for me was like I, I think it was over 50% of these patients who were transported and admitted were discharged to an alternate Thank you. living situation, yeah. right? Yeah. And so Ritu, Dr. Sani and I, you know, see this all the time in our emergency departments when we have so-and-sos brought in and, you know, blah, 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 we do our medical workup and, um, you know, Mrs. Smith can't ambulate, you know, there's no medical thing going wrong with her, but she doesn't have anything, um, you know, specifically medical that needs admission to the hospital, but she doesn't have anyone to take care of her. She's been living at home for so and so long. And just it, that home situation isn't working anymore. And so these, you know, uh, over 50% of these patients were admitted to the hospital. They had a medical condition, but they were discharged to an alternate living situation, which I think is super important for us to keep in mind. Yep. But Dr. Turner, Dr. Turner, we've always done it this way. We've always just done these public assists. <laughs> and some people are like, well, so those aren't patients. We've always done it this way. Yeah. And I'll just say, I think it's the right thing to do for the people that we serve. Yeah. And, and you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, this is the part, this is the part that, you know, I, I don't enjoy. And the fact, the fact is, is that, I'm not going to be had to be the one to write the charts, right? I mean, this is going to, you, you know, I I actually had to redo my my other video because I was sort of downplaying the extra work on documentation, right? Because they're going to have to do more charts, yeah. And so, you know, and one of the guys sort of called me because I always have some people that I send my stuff to because I want to, I, you know, they're the ones out there doing it. So you know, I ran, I always run, especially something like this, by some of my some of my coworkers. So watch the video. Let me know. What do you think? And they're like, dude, don't, don't downplay the amount of work. I mean, they're gonna have to write more charts. And so just say that, you know, um, but explain the reason why, of course, which I did, but, but he, but he was right. You know, this is going to create more work. Um, I sort of feel bad for them, but I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to make it. You know what I mean? Well, and, and I'm not creating more work to create more work. Right? No, I know. And I think the other piece is sometimes people get mad and they're like, just do your job or, or, well, but you know, nobody ever handed a medic a chart, a computer and said and to make and made their job easier. Right. right. We've talked yeah. at length about how, how computerized charting is made the medic job harder, not easier. Yeah. Um, I think we feel pretty pleased with our current, you know, we're a year into into our current um, computer chart, and from what I hear from my crew, the crews, it's much better, much more user friendly than what we were doing previously, and and so it's less work than it had been overall. 
but it's definitely still work. But I mean, it leads to two things. One, the right patient care, identifying patients who are actually patients. Um, And we've repeatedly had these cases crop up and just because we haven't been sued doesn't mean it's not coming. Right. Um, And, and so, and then it protects us. um, You know, it protects us that we've done the right care at best as possible. So here's the the final piece is, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Is, is, you know, how many times have we, um, have we been on, you know, the person who lives at, one, two, three, four, you know, anywhere street. And we have no documentation that we've ever been on that person before because it's just been a lift assist and there's been no patient chart that's been completed. Well, I swear that I've been on Mrs. Smith 11 times, right? But there's no patient before. And so there's been no chart, um, you know, no record of, of those 11 lift assists before. So there's a there's another side of it. Yeah, um, and I think in, in a certain- you're right, it is more work. It's, it's, it's great to see Ginger in here. She said, being dispatched to a lift assist cues the medic's brain on what they're supposed to do on that call. I wonder if it would be better to call them a ground level fall or something different. And that's a great point. And, and one thing that we're actually working with our, our, our call center on is that I, and Ratu, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there is, dis- there, there's not going to be a public assist anymore, right? Lift assist. Well, so we saw this. So what they what they've actually been doing so it used to be if you called nine one one you called our our PSAP and said um, I just need a lift assist they did nothing they just dispatched it fire only yeah, with no use the the process of MPDS stopped right yeah and so now what we've done is they <sighs> go to the fall card on MPDS and go through the thing. And if it's a 17 alpha four, if I want to guess right, I think 17 is fall. No, boom. I'm right here. Yeah. 17. If it's a 17 alpha four, which is going to be, that gets queued out as a, as a public, it still gets set out as a public assist. Yeah. Um, And that's what it, that's what it. That's what the seventeen alpha four is. Yeah, um, I thought there was something about. There. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thought there was some discussion when talking to our colleagues that they were they were going to change something on their end as well. But anyway, regardless, I mean, Sam brings up another good point. Lift assist may also reveal abuse, neglect, or other things that people need to mandatorily report. So yeah, you nailed it. So Absolutely. yeah, so uh, so do me a favor there, and uh, you know, pray for me as this rolls out, so I don't get slaughtered by people across the tri-county area anyway all right let's jump on to our last one um we're doing good here this is something that again you might think to yourself what in the heck is going on here but we have a traumatic cardiac arrest protocol for the first time so uh trauma arrests have always been sort of hat tipped in our other protocols but there it created a little bit of um Oh gosh, ambiguity sometimes in kind of what to do. And so we felt it was probably good to have uh, to sort of, because there's nothing really new in here. It's just sort of consolidating it and putting it into, into its own protocol. Would you agree with that, Dr. Turner? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think we actually had a sub subsection of cardiac yeah. arrest that had a headline of traumatic cardiac arrest, but I mean, there wasn't any good guidance meaningfully uh in it whatsoever which created i think the ambiguity and the uncertainty that led to you know some of the things that we were seeing and that created the just an absolutely great um working product and a great working group through the the protocol development committee and hat tip to uh uh to dr matt neth uh, yeah we had a new we had a newer fantastic job a newer young man, a new medical director in the system, Dr. Neff, who led this group. Um, he's a Florida football fan, so I got to, you know, he likes to give me a little crap there, but it's all right. Uh, I don't know. His coach's wife kisses everybody or something weird. I don't know. It's kind of <laughs> strange. Uh, but he did a fantastic job lead, leading, leading this group. Um, and, and, yeah, for whatever reason, we did not have in our protocols a – 
cardiac arrest. And, you know, this, this goes back to, in some ways, the heart of the question that Rob Lawrence asked, right? Do we need protocols? Are we the only, is this the only, and, and I think there are some medics who would argue that protocols are, uh, you know, doctors don't have protocols. Yeah. Well, you know what though? Um, the oh. most consistent care is provided when we actually have um, basically the equivalent of protocols, which would be like evidence based guidelines that you follow or like bundles. Um, bundled, you know, bundles, exactly. Yeah. Um, we found in our own group at, at in our in our hospital that we if we create a set of orders in Epic that we can all kind of reach and do together that they're all in the same place that the can the care becomes more consistent um and so um this was a this was a place where there was no there was no protocol and the care that was provided was i don't want to say variable in quality because it's not a quality issue the decisions that were being made there was just a lot of variation and some of which we agreed with and some not um, but I can't, I can't call a medic and say, you know, you didn't do what I would do if there's no guidance. Yeah. I mean, that's not their fault. That's my fault as a medical director. And, and so, um, yeah, so that's kind of, I think what led to a lot of this. Yeah. It's, it's so funny. <clears throat> Nick and Nick again, he says, I love the term consider, you know, in quotes, consider, consider these things. And that, that was a, that is so germane to this particular protocol because one of the things <clears throat> that was in here was it, it used the word consider a lot, right? But what it, what it, what the protocol didn't tell you was what to consider, right? Like it had these things in it and it told you consider, you know, uh, decompressing the chest or whatever, I'm making the stuff up now, but just to make the point, but, but there was, we didn't, we didn't give you the background on, on what to take into consideration when you're going to consider something, you know what I mean? Like, and so I think this protocol does a great job of uh, sort of threading some of that stuff out. So <laughs> I mentioned there's not a lot new. We sort of renamed. So you see hat resuscitation there under B under definitions. Um, and really that was just kind of a way to sort of, uh, you know, organize, if you will, uh, the importance of things that need to get done <clears throat> during one of these. And they're not necessarily, um, well, I guess they are sort of in order, aren't they? Hypovolemia. No, airplane. they're not necessarily in. in no, it just in, makes a good acronym. Yeah, just a good acronym. It's not the order you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. So we want to make sure they have plenty of oxygen going. Hypoxia, hypovolemia, tension pneumothorax. And then the other piece that always got confusing for people was when to, like, like when to initiate this, right? It's not when you show up on scene and they're dead. That's not a trauma code, right? Uh, when they lose their pulses in front of you, that's the one, right? They've decompensated in front of you. That's when you might have some reasonable luck. And I think that was the other piece to this is that there was some data that showed that the, the success rate, while still abysmal, is probably not as bleak as we once thought it was if some of these things were done in a timely fashion. Would you guys agree with that? Yep. Yeah, so that's yeah, I mean that's the whole point is to find the people that we can, you know, we can have a meaningful um shot at success in. And it's those people that decompensate in front of us. So and that was some of the discussion that we had about, you know, when do you transfer or excuse me, when do you transport? Um and when do you pull over and how long and and you know that I think that to go back to one of the points that was made earlier about you know, ex, uh, evidence guided and evident or an, an expert opinion, you know, was, was, was one of our longer conversations because we have a mixed, um, a mixed population of, you know, urban, suburban and yeah. rural areas of, you know, the trauma code that's, that's an hour outside of the, the level one trauma center is going to be a little bit different than the, the trauma code that's 15 minutes away. And so those were some of the conversations that we had in that work group and kind of came up with a, 
you know, something that's a little bit rule of rule of thumb, taking your thumb out and saying, well, you know, we don't have clear evidence based on this, but, um, you know, we think maybe 15 minutes within a, uh, within 15 minutes of a, of a uh, trauma center, you should uh, continue on and, and work it um, versus pulling over and uh, working it on the side of the, uh, of the road. So one thing that, yeah. seems to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. I, was gonna say, I just saw Nick's questions about a termination resuscitation protocol. We absolutely do. We had a death in the field. We have a death in the field protocol. And that was again, where the, the problem was, We've been really consistent in our system. If you roll up on a trauma and they're all and they're no signs of life, they're dead. We don't we don't the data is pretty clear that if if the, they lost signs of life before EMS arrives, they don't we don't have to begin resuscitation. Where we we're having variability was again, as as Dr. Turner said, when they code when they arrest right in front of you. You've already, you got there, they have signs of life. What do you do now? And some folks were transporting over a long distance. Some people were transporting and then calling it. And, um, you know, we, we want people to do the things that they can do to fix these quickly. But we also don't want long distance ground code three transports if we don't have to have them. Um, so we just need that kind of happy medium. Yeah. Um, you probably noticed that in there, there's no, it, it does uh, mention to do chest compressions. I think this is a bit of a controversy um, in the trauma world. I was just seeing a whole thread on Twitter the other day about, you know, doing compressions on a traumatic arrest because all the interventions we're going to do, wouldn't compressions make them all pointless? Well, and that's what we put in the, the protocol is that, we, we want you to do the things that are included in the hat resuscitation yeah. um, and do chest compressions as long as it doesn't interfere with checking the stuff off the, uh, the list that could be potentially life-saving for the trauma patient. Yeah. And this is another one where, I mean, our, our trauma surgeons expect compre compression. We had a couple of instant, you know, we talked to them about it and they, although there's zero zero data are you saying zero is in are you saying pan <laughs> zero <laughs> about the impact of chest compressions on trauma traumatic arrest yeah. yeah you know physiologically if there's no blood that doesn't make any sense to me but if it's a head injury that does make some sense to me sure yeah 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 well it depends it depends as nick said yeah and jay-z and and Jay-Z. Yeah. Jay-Z's in the house. Well, that's really all I got, boys. We had a couple of OB. We had an OB one where we added some language around blood pressure because how often do you transport somebody whose blood pressure is 160 over 100 and you don't think twice about it? Oh, all the time. No. But if that person is in their third trimester, or if they are recently postpartum, that's important. That's so we know. added some language around that. And a great example, I, you know, we, we tout that we follow standards or ahead of standards, but we were actually behind on neonatal resuscitation. So we had to make sure that we had to um, tweak our neonatal protocol to be consistent with NRP where we agree with NRP. <laughs> um, so we had, um, we had not yet removed oxygen from the NRP mm. update a couple of years ago says no oxygen for initial respiratory yeah. uh, support. So we were still doing oxygen. Yeah, you're right. So we had those two also. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Should I just get us out of here? I guess the Blazers well, are on in half an hour, so it's all good. What's on? The Blazers. Oh, yeah. Uh, ball sports. Sports ball. Sports Things ball. I used to go to. <laughs> did you get your cutout? I did not get a Blazer cutout. 
Come on, Chiefs. I was on. thinking. I will tell you this though, Mike. I was thinking about when we went to the Blazer game together, and the guy hit my car. <laughs> oh my gosh! That turned a long night into a long night, didn't it? It did. I think we were trying to leave early, weren't we? Did we? I don't remember. Probably. Yeah. Uh, that's good times. That seemed like a couple of years, like three years ago. That was a couple of years ago. And I just want to point out in the chat that my brother just posted again that I am the fantasy football championship. Oh, good. Well, you are. my team, the Nerf Herders. <laughs> All right. I'm getting us out of here. On behalf of Dr. John Turner and Dr. Ratusani, Mike Verkest, you've been listening to and watching the Second Shift podcast. We are a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast Network and a Fire Dog production. Happy New Year. We will see you guys in January with more amazing stuff. All right. You guys take care. Have a good night. We'll see you later.